The bookmakers have released their over and under projected win totals for every AFL team. And I've got the great man Smithy along for the ride as we go through whether we think your team will go over or under. Let's have a chat. Rioli brilliant here. Absolutely brilliant, Rioli. Fantastic. Speaking of the great man, he's right here. Smithy, we have done a lot of things together in the last year in terms of content, whether it's NFL content, you've been on the channel a few times. But uh, it's good to have you back on, mate. Always good to have a chat. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to come on here. And uh, like we've said a few times, I am the inaugural subscriber to the Daz Talk 3 channel. So um, yep. it's always always good to come on here. And it, it's been a pleasure to watch the channel grow as it has. So, um, yeah. Let's start with the Crows. Nine and a half wins. I know there's an extra game, Smid. I know there is, but I I can't see the Crows going 10 and 13 or better than this. So I'm going the under, and there's going to be a a lot of pressure on one Isaac Rankin, I think, in 2023. Yeah, I'm with you on the under there. It's I just haven't seen the list improvement for them to win so many more games than what they did last year. Um, I do think there'll be that natural progression, but I worry about their key back socks with um, obviously Fisher Mackesy announcing he's stepping away from the game of footy. So that's another key back down. If they lose one of Jordan Butts or, you know, an Elliot Himmelberg or something like that, I think they're in big strife down back. Um, so that worries me. I still don't know if they've got the firepower up forward. Um, I think their midfield is in pretty good shape, but, uh, if you if you can't kick a winning score and if you can't stop an opposition team kicking a winning score, uh, pretty simple. You're in a bit of trouble. Um, so I, I think the Crows go under as well. Yeah, I hope Darcy Fogarty becomes one of the best keys in the game because he's got a beautiful kicking style. But yeah, mm-hmm. unders for the both of us. Let's go to Brisbane, 13 and a half. And it's pretty simple here for me. Brisbane just need to finish top four need to win a couple of finals and need to be there on the last day in September. So with that natural progression, I'm taking the over. Yeah, the extra game, um, it makes this a, a pretty low line, in my opinion. You know, if they just beat it, they're 14 and 9. And, you know, I went through and did a full season predictor online and um, went through every game and the results. And I cannot see nine losses on their fixture. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's a pretty comfortable over. The thing that, they struggled with last year uh, was their their key to, uh, forwards at times, but you've added Jack Gunston, who is just going to do wonders to this forward line, in my opinion. Um, they brought in Josh Dunkley, Will Ashcroft, to just bolster that already really impressive midfield. Um, Marcus Adams being out for most of the season, or if not all of the season, on the inactive list that's a blow for them. But um, I think they've they've got the cattle to sort of work around that um it will be missed and all the best to him in his recovery mm. with the lingering concussion issues but um i do think the lions will be able to cover this pretty easily yeah couldn't agree more about marcus adams and harris andrews just needs to return to just being a stopper doesn't need to try to do too much i like darcy gardner as a player down back as well but yeah for brisbane it's they've got all the tools and just go, go and do it simply now I think these came out just before we heard the news about Sam Walsh being out with back surgery, which is not good, but he is up and running at about two thirds pace, only 26 days after surgery, Smith. This yeah. man is a genuine genetic freak. And he had the syndesmosis last year that they were saying he was going to be out forever. And he came back in what, round two or three? And you know, yeah. it just came back and had 25. And you just thought, oh, Sam Walsh is back. There you go. Just like nothing. And, <laughs> But you know it's peak AFL preseason when we're doing uh, fractions of running pace. I can't wait till he hits seven nights. It's going to be uh, <laughs> excitement all over the internet. <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. But uh, Carlton thirteen and a half, so they're going to have to drop ten games, which looks difficult with the extra game. But yeah. if there's one team that is going to really blow the line, it could be the Blues. Their biggest challenge seems to be themselves. I mean, they're either going to win 13 or 14 games. For me, this is the perfect line. Whichever algorithm came up with this number, I think you've nailed it. I am going to take the over because kind of like how fans feel about Geelong, surely at some point they have to be bad. I'm flipping that for the Blues. At some point, they have to be good. They can't have their group of eight. So their top eight players are some of the best in the competition in terms of a top eight combined. You can't be that good 
and continually stumble. So for once, the Blues have got to get in, Smid. And I, yeah. I, I'm hoping it's this year because I'm picking the over just. They'll probably go 14 and 9 and we'll just get there. Yeah, I had the over as well. I think I had them at 15 and 8 when I did the the picker online. So that was over. The Walshing is a red flag, but as you said, he's a genetic freak. So um, for all we know, he'll be back in round four, just like he hasn't missed a beat. Kerno and McKay, arguably the uh, top two tall forward combination with Hawkins and Cameron, obviously. Um, so they're going to put points up. I really love Michael Voss. I think another preseason under his belt with this group is going to do the world of good. Um, and I really like their draft. So, yeah, I, I think they're going to have to go over. They, As you said, they just have to get to that next step sooner yeah. rather than later. Yeah, I agree with you. So both the over there, and if there's one man that needs to break out this year, I might. This might be spoiling a future video. I don't know, but Adam Chera, or oh, I reckon it could be a big year for the Chera man. So let's go to the pies. Uh, Twelve and a half. Yep, I'm reading that right. Yeah. So I mean, this one's difficult for me as well because you can't win twelve games by single digits and have it be a fluke, but you also can't sit here and say they're going to do that again. So it's, this is a difficult one for me. Yeah, it was difficult for me as well. There were a lot of games that came up on their fixture that were 50-50. I did have the over when I originally did it. I think a lot of this is going to hinge on Darcy Cameron, um, who got sent for scans yesterday on an injury he did during training. If that's significant, what's their ruck situation looking like? It, it could it could really come back to bite them that they got rid of Brody Grundy. Um, Cameron did do a good job, and I know you can't predict injuries, so it, it, you can't blame Collingwood for this. But um, you know, it, it would really hurt the ruck stocks. They have loaded up their midfield, so if they don't have a dominant ruckman, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world. But um, Darcy Cameron was very valuable for them. Still question marks on their scoring, but I think their game style is just going to hold up. Um, as I said, they made a few key. Um, inclusions over the off season. So I will still go the over, but uh, it's a very cautious over. Yeah, I think I'm with you on a cautious over as well. I think Tom Mitchell, I know some people in the comments have uh, laughed this off, but I still think Tom Mitchell's going to be up there in the brown low. Just that in and under burrowing style is going to suit that Collingwood midfield so beautifully. Dan McStay did play the best game of his career as a ruckman. I think when Oscar McInerney went down, so they could be able to plug him in there, but considering you got Cox and I think Aiden Begg would be their next Ruckman up, that is a huge concern, especially with so many teams now with a good one-two punch. You think of Freo, Melbourne, yeah. these kind of teams. Even North, if Tristan Sherry comes along, would be a pretty good combination as well. So I'm with you. Uh, a cautious over, which I like. So we're going to have to start disagreeing here at some point. Great, man. Maybe it's the Bombers. Ten and a Maybe. half. New coach. Uh, your and if I remember correctly, in our bold predictions, you predicted an upward spike for the boys at the hangar. Yeah, I did have them as my risers up the ladder. Um, I still have them under ten and a half wins, though. Um, I think I had them at ten and thirteen, which um, is funny because another really good line. Um, but I do expect them to be better this year. I think Brad Scott you know, deserved a hell of a lot more credit for his job at North. And I think you're in the same page. You've said it on your videos before, Daz, that mm -hmm. uh, the list he took to two preliminary finals was um, average. Let's let's be brutally honest and no disrespect to any of those North players at the time. But um, for those guys to get to two prelims and be, you know, facing the 2015 West Coast side that uh, made the grand final against Hawthorne, and the 2013-14 Sydney 14, side. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that made the grand final as well. Both were favourites against Hawthorne in those grand finals. So uh, very good effort. They've got the midfield stars, big names, Zach Merritt, Darcy Parrish, Dylan Shield, Andy McGrath. So, you know, they will have production in there. I think, again, for them, forward line is my concern. Peter Wright had a good year. Um, but he can't be your lone hand. Harrison Jones has another preseason, but what can he do? Can he take the next step and have a Todd Marshall sort of leap um, as that young forward who 
comes out and produces what's Jake Stringer going to do. There's a lot of question marks, so I, I can't go the over for them. I have to take the under. Yeah, I'm under as well, but more under. I'm looking at six. Six and 17 just seems right for me with the Bombers. It's The one thing about Brad Scott, and I do admire this about him as a coach, is if you're not ready to play the right way, his way, the blue-collar way as it was at North, you're not getting a game, whether it's Zach Merritt or um, uh, Elijah Sardis, who they just drafted, and anyone in between, right? There is going to be no chance you're going to play for Brad Scott if you're not bringing... Uh, toughness and a willingness to compete, simply put. So I think for Bombers fans, I reckon the first six weeks of the season, regardless of result, you are going to learn a lot about the kind of players that you've got. So even though I'm taking the under, it's not going to be doom and gloom regardless of where they finish on the ladder. It's going to be a learning experience and we'll see where they're at. But the under, again, for the both of us, let's go to the Dockers. Yeah. The Dockers, the uh, 11 and a half. I mean, they're a good side, Smid, but there's just one question that lingers. How in the hell are they going to score? This is probably my most confident over of the day, to be completely honest with you. I'm a huge uh, Fremantle fan coming into this year, Um, not in terms of my actual fandom, but just um, (laughs) in terms of how I feel about them. I think they're going to be fantastic. And I think the key to your scoring problems is one nat five. Um, there was an article that came out the other day that he has spent 90% of the preseason as a forward. They're going to keep him deep. And if he can fix his goal-kicking worries, he could be a 40-plus goal a year prospect because he's got the natural forward craft. He is a beast physically. So, you know, if you put a small on him, he's going to outmuscle him. And if you put a tall on him, he's going to run rings around him. So he's going to be a tricky matchup. Um, if he can just get that set shot goal kicking down pat. Um, imagine him as a third tall with, uh, you know, Tabana and Jai Miss. Luke Jackson I mean. can pinch hit down there. Uh, Lockie Schultz, Michael Walters, and Michael Frederick as your smalls. That's a very quick and agile small forward brigade. I actually think that their forward line is going to be fine. I think their back line's very good. I think their midfield is very good. I think they're one of the more rounded um, and well-balanced sides in the AFL this year. And that home ground advantage is going to be huge for them over in Perth. I I can see them winning north of 15 games, honestly. I think they're going to be one of the big-time contenders come September. Yeah, I have them between 12 and 14. So I am going the over as well, but maybe not as optimistic as, uh, as you for this one, mate. But... Yeah, I do worry about that forward line. And you also missed uh, a c- couple of their great forwards as well. Your Sam Swikowski and Bailey Banfield, of course, up forward who can provide a bit. I don't I don't know of a, a media person that loves a fringe 22 player than Jared Healy loves Bailey Banfield. I don't know if you've ever watched a Fremantle game where Jared's been commentating, but it's it's sickening almost. Yeah. The man crushed to the man's goal, Bailey Banfield. So. Uh, good luck to you. I still think the over as well, but I'm still concerned that when the going gets tough, if you're relying on a 19-year-old key forward, uh, I know he was really good, and he's my man, but I know he was really good in that final as well. But if you're telling me that the key to scoring is going to be a bloke that's never played forward for a full season, and I think a 29-year-old Matt Tabernard, I just I have some concerns. But we're both going the over because the rest of their squad is awesome. The Cats, they're actually going to be bad at some point, Smid. They've never, yeah. in their history, they've never finished below 12th, yeah. ever. That makes me it's, angry. Yeah, it's it's the same success like we've never seen. Um, and the fact that they won a grand final and arguably got better, better in the offseason, yeah. it's just, disgusting. it rubs me up the wrong way. I know they lost Joel Selwood, um, you know, captain legend of the club arguably one of the greatest cats of all time so obviously he's going to be missed but the fact that they can bring in young talent like tanner brune like jack bows like oliver henry um, and like the seventh overall pick in jai clark who <laughs> people are saying is joel so with 2.0 like come on seriously um when's it gonna stop it at this stage you can't predict the under you just can't because yeah. They get the extra game. Are they going to lose more than six games this year? I really doubt it. I really doubt it. Um, 
speaking of home field advantages down there in Geelong, like, I mean, they're pretty much unbeatable down there. So any game they get down there is a win. Um, the only way I can see them going under is if they get off to a red hot start and just go, all right, let's just rest players. Let's throw in the towel and a few games to rest everyone for finals because, yeah, this is a, a scary sort of proposition, this Geelong side. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. The over, and I know it might be a pipe dream for some, including a lot of Hawthorne fans out there, that the, cat, that the Cats finally turned bad. It ain't happening. It's, no. just, it's not, and I don't see it happening for a while. They were resting blokes throughout games last year under complaint. Like, Danger got rested. He didn't want to be rested. And they said, well, we're resting you. So, you know, what are you going to do? And it just happened throughout the year. It's extraordinary. I hate it. But I yeah. love it for Geelong fans and love it for Geelong people. But this is just, just be bad. Just once. Yeah. Be, and the, just experience and, it like the rest of us. And the thing is, when they rest people, they can bring in someone like, I know he's gone now to Hawthorne, but like they rest Danger, they bring in someone like Cooper Stevens and he has 20-odd yeah. touches on debut and, and just <laughs> fits in like a hand in a glove. And then they go, all right, Danger's back in, see you later, champ. So, yeah, <laughs> the depth they've got is scary. There's something ridiculously special happening down there. Yeah, we haven't seen enough of Mitch Nevitt. If they rest a Ruckman, Toby Conway hopefully going to be fit. We saw some Shannon Neal as well as a Ruck. Asafa Radagalia couldn't get a spot in this side. They put him to defense in the VFL. To see, it's, I'm going to stop talking about it, but the Cats, both of us going the over. The Suns, 11 and a half. So basically, are they going to win more or lose more than half their games? That's simply the line at 11 and a half. Ben King is welcome back and uh, to Jared Healy. He's playing forward. This is a big year for the Suns and a big year for Stewie Drew. At this point, I know we say it, we've said it a couple of times in the last couple of years that, all right, now you've got some expectations on you. If Marby or Chol and Levi Casbolt can kick nearly 90 between them, they should be kicking big enough scores to go over 500 Smith, to use the NBA term. Yeah, they should be. Although I can't see them doing it. I'm taking the under. Um, And I, I want to be, I want to be optimistic about Gold Coast because you know, it gets to a point where you see a side struggle for so long and um, I'll go to the American sports that we talk about, Daz, and it's the same with, like, the New York Jets this year in the NFL. <laughs> you know, ever since we've been NFL fans, the New York Jets have just been the laughing stock of the NFL. Um, and finally this year they started to win games and everyone seemed to be getting on the bandwagon and then once again it just fell off towards the end of the year and I can see that happening with Gold Coast um, I do like what they've got going on. I think they've got a really good midfield with Took Miller, Jared Witts in the Bruck, Noah Anderson's been fantastic. Uh, Matt Rowell, can he get some consistency? Um, I really struggle to see him being a, an electric midfielder. He really needs to be better outside of the stoppage, um, which, you know, I'd be happy to come on and talk about in more depth. Um, but yeah, I, I just have some question marks still about the Suns. I don't know. It's one of the cases where I need to see it for a full season before I can yeah. go, yeah, I'm confident in predicting it to happen. So until they can do it, I'm just going to keep going under. <laughs> oh, it's the anti-Geelong, if you will. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 I'm I'm going to have – I think there's one team a year that you kind of got to look at the line and just say, oh, fate, head needs to, uh, heart needs to overtake head. I'm going to do that for the Suns. I'm going to take the over. I've got a soft spot for the Suns. I like I like their top end a lot. How do you not love Took Miller for a start? Yeah. He's a great man. The Took Took himself. He's a star. Again, I hope Matt Real uh, goes. Noah Anderson is definitely a smoky for All-Australian this year. If the All-Australian selectors actually picked Wingman, then he would be definitely in with a chance, but that's a rant for another day. Ben King back fully fit, healthy, hopefully helps out. And it's not like he's got to do it himself. Like we said, I love Sam Collins and Charlie Ballard down back. I do think their rebounding out of their defensive 50 is a big cause of concern. And I know they've got a lot of players that can come in and out of games, but natural improvement and a hope that the Gold Coast are good I'm going to take the over, and I can accept if they go under as an L because, you know, it's a soft spot and you're a loud one. All right. So finally, we disagree. There's going to be no disagreement here, Smid. GWS, nine and a half. They are not getting near 10 wins for me. This is just 
put your house in the no, this is not gambling advice, but I'll be putting the house, my neighbor's house, and probably anyone else's houses that want to come in here. They they they're gonna surprise some teams, they're gonna play some electric footy at times. Ten wins, yeah, no, not happening. Borderline finals team, if they can get over this line, which is <laughs> yeah, it's it's not gonna happen. Um I do like the coaching hire. I do like the draft strategy, but they've just they've still got work to do. I feel like the old regime needs to make way for the new regime. And with a new coach, sometimes it takes that, you know, twelve to eighteen months to to build the list and to build the game style that you want to have. I think it's gonna be a year of transition. Um, with some older guys, I can see people like Nick Haynes being transitioned out of the side. Um, you know, maybe some players like Josh Kelly will move to positions they don't want to play. The new, uh, you know, Adam Kingsley's going to do what he needs to do to get this team where he wants it to be. And if that means losing some games, then so be it. So, yeah, I think this is a pretty obvious under. Yeah, I think so. I think Toby Green, he could be the highlights package and what brings people in to watch games. But I'm looking forward to seeing Aaron Cadman, of course, the number one pick. And uh, Sam Taylor, my man down back, he's oh, he's going to have some jobs ahead of him this year. But uh, we're both going to go under on that as well. Uh, let's go to our Hawks. Seven and a half wins. So eight and 15 will get us the over. I know there are some Hawks fans that think we're going to come last, Smith. There are some that think we're going to be on the fringes of the eight. So seven and a half mightn't be a bad line here. Yeah, I'm probably smack bang in the middle of yeah, those two groups, seven if, or eight. I'm, I'm with if you. I'm being honest. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't see us finishing last, that's for sure. Um, I think we've got a lot more talent than people give us credit for, but I would be shocked if we were contending for finals towards the back end of the yeah. season. I think we're going to be you know, in that awkward sort of spot where you're too good to get a top three pick, but you're not good enough to be a finals team. And that's not a position you want to be in, but with the Hawks' age profile, if you see the natural improvement from the young kids, you can handle it because you know that you're trending in the right direction. And that's what I think we're going to see. Um, I do think that Hawthorne's drafting over the last two or three years has been outstanding. Obviously, we got great return on investment in year one from Josh Ward, Connor McDonald, Sam Butler. Um, Those three played a lot of senior footy. We even saw Ned Long get a crack at it, which was fantastic. And Jai Sarong played a few games there. So to have every draftee play a game in year one, fantastic. Uh, we've got Cam McKenzie and Josh Weddle first round picks. I think they can both impact year one as well. Uh, and then we've got a few um, sort of athletes that will try and mold through the VFL, um, which I like. Carl Amon, my man, big inclusion. Um you know, it's, it's going to be great to see him go around. And I'm hearing nothing but great things about Lloyd Meek and what he has done. Um, and a lot of people thinking that he can be a real difference maker. So the off-season, big tick for me. Natural improvement, big tick. Um, I think we'll, we'll go over this line, to be honest. Oh, he's gone the over. I think we're going to get, because it reminds me, so round two last year, I know you'll remember this, Smid. We went over to Adelaide Oval and just beat the pants off Port. And yeah. no one saw that coming. There's going to be results like that. But then you look at the games we had against St. Kilda, in which we were just never in it from the start. There's there's the uh, disapproving look. There's, yeah, and we're going to get results like that as well. I think seven wins is about right. But we've only got one player over the age of 30 on the list. That's Luke Bruce. But I think this is going to be the year of the Chad. Now, I don't know whether that's a good or a bad thing yet. If he has a good year, the Chad, he can be sort of the glue that helps keep that forward line together. But if we don't get the return on Chad, oh, she might be all over at Hawthorne. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the Chad goes. But also, you said your man Carl Amon came off something like six years in a row of winning a time trial at Port. And then he walks into Hawthorne and he comes third behind a Ruckman that hasn't played yet and an 18-year-old in Josh Weddle who has been training on a wing. So we were dead on when we were talking about uh, Josh Weddle not being used as a defender. Looks like that's not going to be the case. And, geez, that makes me excited for what a 195-centimetre kid can do on the wing, Smith. And go check out uh, Talking Hawks if you want some more specific Hawthorne chats from Daz and I and a few of the other lads. So it's a good source of Hawthorne conversation if you're into that. 
Absolutely. So we disagree on the Hawks. Let's go to the D's. 14 and a half is the line. They picked up Brody Grundy, of course, and Lockie Hunter in the offseason. Kind of a an acquisition not talked about, really. Lockie Hunter on that wing. So him and Ed Langdon are going to cause some problems between the D50 and forward 50, mate. But it looks like the new age tall forwards are going to be the go for the Ds with Jacob Van Ruin and Matty Jefferson being drafted in the last two years as they try to figure out a potential Tom McDonald health problem and a Ben Brown form problem. How do you see the Ds this year? Yeah, it's they are, I think they're one of the trickiest teams to predict what they're going to do, in my opinion, because obviously, you know, you don't have to think far back to recall the 2021 um, Premiership run and just how unbelievably dominant this exact list was, um, you know, during that final series and and then the start to 2022 and they looked like they were primed to go back to back and it just sort of fell apart a little bit towards the end. Uh, getting bounced in straight sets in the finals. But, you know, you, they could either go one of two ways. They can, you know, keep on that downward trajectory and just end up being a middle of the road, you know, elimination final team, or they can get back to their best. And with stars like Petrarca, Oliver, Max Gorn, Jack Viney in the midfield, you know, Ed Langdon, Lockie Hunter, arguably one of the best wing combinations in the game at the moment. Uh, I'm backing them in to go over. And I think their defense is going to be what does it for them. I know they've got the question marks about their forward line, and that is absolutely justified. But this was the best defense for the last you know, 18 months. And I think that's what's going to carry them throughout this season. I think they're just going to be able to shut teams down, win some scrappy games, and find their way into the top four. So I'll take that over. Yeah, I think it's over as well. But And this is going to sound strange, but I think Melbourne will be better served going 17 and 6, 18 and 5 around that mark than going, say, trying to jump for a 21 and 2 or 20 and 3 kind of season. They just need to get into the top four, a bit like Brisbane. They just need to get into the top four and then be healthy. That's it. They don't need to finish first. They don't need to finish second. When you win a grand final in Perth, you cannot be questioned about your ability to travel, in my yeah. opinion. So it's they don't need to worry about that at all. Be healthy, be in the four, and they should be good to go. So I am going the over as well. I don't think they go 13 and 10, even if they do get some injuries along the way. But, yeah, I hope they don't try to do the whole 10 and 0 run and go from there. Rest some guys if you need to. I wonder if we'll get some games where either Gorn or Grundy are rested. Maybe they go one or the other throughout the year, which they might do. It would be a nightmare for fantasy players, but that's not the conversation. Uh, let's go to our old coach, Smid. Clarko takes over the yeah. Kangaroos. Six and a half yeah. is the Kangaroos line. Ben Cunnington has not missed a session which is fantastic news after his health battles, of course, over the last year, 18 months. Plenty of ruse, we're being told, are flying on the track, Smid, but a bit like the other new coaches, Clarko just needs to see what he's got at the moment. Yeah, this has got 05 Hawthorne written all <laughs> over it, in my opinion. Um, Clarko's going to come out and just, you know, wean out the people he, that he doesn't believe uh, fit for his list. Um, there's going to be... A lot of people play senior footy and he's going to put them in the in the biggest spots to see who can shine and you know it, it, there was a lot of that in 2005 Hawthorne were really bad that year but he shaped his list and he put people in situations where either they stood up or they got out essentially and mm. um there was a lot of list turnover 2006 um, Hawthorne won the last four games of the season and then we know what happened in 2007 and then eventually 2008. So, you know, obviously it's an easy comparison considering it's the same coach, but um, it, it does have that written about it. I'd say under, um, mm -hmm. but we're going to learn a hell of a lot about who is the real deal in red, uh, in the white and blue this year. Yeah, absolutely. So it seems like Will Phillips, who if there was one bloke in the competition that I want a full season that's not on my team, because uh, the one on my team actually shares a first name with him, but Will Phillips, I hope we can see the best of what he's got. Even with his illnesses and his issues last year, he's still being compared to guys from the draft like he had a say in being drafted where he was and where he ended up. So I hope he lights it up. Josh Godar off the halfback line, I think he's going to be a guy that North fans latch onto 
really quick throughout the season. And Harry Sheasel looks round one ready from all reports, Mid. So I'm looking forward to seeing how the Sheasel goes in the AFL system as well. But I'm with you. They need to figure out who their second call is. I think Tristan Sherry needs to take over a lot of the ruck duties. So when Todd Goldstein eventually hangs the boots up as an absolute underrated star of that footy club, then they've got a way forward. But yeah, it's a complete fact-finding mission for Kaiko. I don't expect them to win too many games. So let's go to Port. And I put, I put a poll out on Twitter. I did it on YouTube as well. Who's going to finish higher on the ladder, Port Adelaide or the Western Bulldogs? We'll talk about, obviously, the Bulldogs last. But 11 and a half for Port. I love the line because this is just polarizing. Some people yeah. think they're going to be pretty good and top four worthy. Some of them think they're going to be bottom four worthy. And the line is a smack bang in the middle. So how do you see Ken Hinckley in maybe his last season in the Port Adelaide Footy Club? Yeah, I think, especially when you talk about the Bulldogs and Port Adelaide, I feel like you won't find a person out there that think they're both going to be good. Yeah. And you won't find a person out there who think they're both going to be bad. Just for some reason, you're either Port are good, Bulldogs are bad, or your Bulldogs are good, Port are bad. And I don't know yeah. why, but <laughs> I'm in the camp of Port are going to be good. I have got them going over, and I have them making an elimination final. And... I just feel like they underperformed so poorly last year and they've got that much talent around, you know, and I just buy into the excitement factor of them. You know, you Connor Rosie, you Zach Butters, your Jason Horn Francis, you know, that is the sort of nucleus that can just excite and ignite a football club and um, you know, they've got the aging veterans like Trav Boak. I do have concerns about their tall backs and it's been a concern with Port Adelaide for as long as I can remember, really. Um, but I just feel like their forward line is going to be high powered. You know, Charlie Dix, Todd Marshall had a really good year last year. Mitch Georgiades is the third tall. is just beautiful. They got Junior Rioli in there to be that small forward. I feel like they're going to put up big scores this year and they're going to do enough to go over this line. Yeah, I think if uh, if there is any punting to be done on Port throughout the year, I think it's going to be just total points over for the games because yeah. there's going to be not a lot of defense going on, which is a concern. Uh, I'm going under. I think this has got 11 and 12 written all over them, Port, and I think it needs to happen because with a list as young and exciting as they are, I can't see any evidence that Ken Hinckley's the guy to carry this club to their next flag. So I think the best thing for the club might be if it's another middle of the road year and they bring in a new coach, fresh excitement with a list as young as they are. Cause the only guys that I could pretty much see being out of the form on age in the next two years would be Charlie Dixon and Travis Boak. The rest of that group is pretty solid already and can band together, it just might take a final push from someone out there to get Port over the line. So I'm going to go under. And let's go to the Tigers. Mm. 13 and a half is the line. They bring in Taranto. They bring in Hopper. Josh Gibkiss is going to be out for 10 to 12 weeks with a uh, high hamstring tear. So that is not fantastic for Joshy G. What a star he was last year. Now, Smith, there haven't really been a lot of teams in the AFL that have won some flags and then taken a couple of years off before winning another one. So we saw the Hawks 13, 14, 15, did pretty well in 16 and 18, but haven't really got anywhere near it since. Brisbane, oh one, two, three, and then the place capitulated for nearly 15 years. Uh, we saw Geelong, 07, 9, 11. I know they got close a couple of times, but they didn't win another flag until obviously 2022. So history tells us they're not on Richmond's side. Yet I am locking, I don't know whether we are locking or whatever, but they're going over for me. This is a 16 and 7 side. If Tom Lynch is fit, they're going over unbelievably well for mine. And I think Shea Bolton needs to stay inside 50 and kick 50 this year. And Richmond are a smoky to win the flag for me. Yeah, I'm going over as well. And my big concern with Richmond last year was their midfield. Um, you know, Dion Prestia, the poor bugger, hurts himself getting out of bed in the morning. So um, I hope he can have a good run at it because whenever he plays, he is a gun. Like There's no denying that he has the ability to be a fantastic player, but he just has no luck with his body. 
you know, they were relying on a midfield combination of, you know, an old Trent Cochin, Dion Prestia, and Dustin Martin coming back from a severe injury last year. It, it just wasn't the go. They've got in two bona fide midfield guns in Tim Taranto and Jacob Hopper, who can jump straight in and be in their best centre bounds combination um, and play bulk midfield time. Let Dusty Martin play 50 50 forward in midfield. Let Dion Prestia play low time on ground to help his body uh, and just make Tim Taranto the absolute workhorse. I think he's going to have a huge year. I'm a massive fan of his and his talent. I, I, the Josh Gibkiss injury hurts, but I still have faith um, in their backline socks. And yeah, as you said, if Tom Lynch can stay healthy, he looked like the most dominant forward in the AFL at times last year. So uh, his health is paramount, but I'm going over as well. Yeah, this is just – speaking of te- – if they do win the flag this year, they're probably going to overtake Geelong as the team that annoys me the most. Because, all right, you had your success. Yeah, go away and rebuild again. This topping up and becoming great again, it's it's starting to give me the uh, the SHI, Smith. But let's go from Richmond to the Saints, 11 and a half. I, I, I thought the Giants were my most confident under. This could be a rowdy second. Yes. The, the Saints. Max King's out, as we know. Um, the Saints just they just need to figure out. Ross Lyon needs to figure out what he's got and what he's gonna do with it. I think they're gonna they're gonna beat some bad teams. I think they're gonna surprise a couple of good teams, but I cannot see them going twelve and eleven or better. I can't see them winning ten games, let alone twelve. Um there you go. if you if you had to ask me at the end of the Saints season last year. Now, Smid, what is the worst thing that can happen to St Kilda between now and round one next year? And I would have said season-ending injury, Max King. Yeah, that it's literally the worst possible thing that they could have, you know, well, not dreamed of, but had nightmares about is Max King being out for the season because he was their forward line last year. And, you know, you can argue that that's detrimental to them, but it's just fact. That's who they went to. Um, and now Jack Hayes is injured. Who who is going to be their tall forward? Tom Campbell with Tim Membry as their you know second medium sized tall. Yikes! It's not looking good. Um, so yeah, I have massive concerns about St Kilda. I I do feel like they're they're getting their midfield into a space now where it's not as one dimensional as what we were complaining about this time last year. So I feel like that is a positive for them. They're going to have Hunter Clark and Nick Caulfield back down in the back line. That'll add some spark to their rebound game. But the the Max King one is just an absolute season breaker for me. Yeah, even if he is back projected round six to eight. So let's go best case scenario six. I haven't got their fixture in front of me. But even if they start one and five, two and four, yeah, they got the extra game. But then you've got to win 10 of your last 18 which is to get the over, which is just extraordinary. You need everything to go right. So Ross, fact-finding mission, he's going to have to find some things out pretty quickly. I love their youth. St. Kilda have drafted really well last three years, I reckon, from memory. So we'll see how they go. In a few years, they could jump up, maybe even two, but I can't see it happening in 2023. Yeah. All righty, the Swans. I was just going to say quickly, oh, and sorry, mate. No. if Max King does get back for, you know, say, around six to eight in that period, He's going to have no preseason under his belt. So he's not going to come back and be that dominant force straight away. He's going to take a good month to get his feet under him. You don't have that time if you start one and five, two and four, you know, so another reason why. But the Swans coming off the grand final, and as we know that statistically getting smashed in the grand final does not lead to success the year after, Mm -hmm. which isn't in Sydney's favour. The thing that is in their favour is their age profile. They've got a lot of young stars who, um, you know, can take that step. Will the scarring and, you know, if you want to say emotional damage from that loss do take a hold on them, that will be disappointing. But you look at the likes of Chad Warner, Callum Mills, James Rowbottom, you know, these are all young guys who had really good seasons. And if you'd hope that it lit a fire in their stomach to come out bigger and better this year. And if you're looking at culture, you know, culture's thrown around a lot in sport mm-hmm. and in AFL a lot, but it it's not a tangible thing, but 
if you just look at Sydney, they've got it in spades, and um, that's why I'm tipping they go over. Yeah, over for me as well. 15 and 8, I think, is kind of where I see them being, and anything higher, it would be very, very good. Looking forward to seeing how Logan McDonald bounces back from being dropped. So that's going to be a, a really good sign of a, a young man's progress. And if you're not happy, El Mac, there's a there's a joint at Waverley that would have you with open arms. Let me tell you. <laughs> Logan McDonald and Mitchie Lewis, yes, please. But, yeah, over for the Swans. I just love everything that they're doing at the moment. Uh, Ruck is a little bit of a concern. I can't think if they drafted a Ruckman. They might have. I might have just forgotten about it. But, um, yeah, Tom Hickey can't do it all himself. But the Swannies, they'll go over until I see it. Otherwise, West Coast, two to go, seven yeah. and a half. What do you reckon, Smid? It was a horror show last year. It was a nightmare for them, and I don't know if it gets much better. And, you know, this is where I think the Hawthorne disrespect comes into play a little bit because <laughs> West Coast and Hawthorne having the same line, I can't quite understand. Hawthorne beat Geelong and Brisbane last year during the year, um, two of the top four teams. And West Coast didn't really get close to anyone. Hawthorne had a better off-season than West Coast and they're projected to win the same amount of games. I just don't understand it. I think they go under. Um, they just need to keep rebuilding this um, this list. I do like what they did in the draft with uh, Ruben Jinby. Um, I think that's a massive get. And I was a massive fan of Elijah Hewitt as well, who they drafted. So getting the, the homegrown talent is a big tick for me um but you know where is their where's their midfield at can we get a a full tim kelly season can dom sheed come back from the injury how long of luke shuey have we got left where's elliot yo gonna play how long has nick nat got left after an injury plagued 2022 there's just so many question marks around west coast that you have to take the under yeah i think i'm gonna take the over I think Ooh. I'm gonna buy. I think I'm gonna buy into the Eagles this year a little bit. So, these are, this is gonna be the only team. So before everyone comments, because I can see typing away, this is the team that I'm buying into all the preseason optimism. Right? I don't know why, but I just am. But as soon as I read, uh, I think it was Nathan Schmuck. I think it might have been, if I'm pronouncing that right. Who, after match simulation, when I'm hearing Oscar Allen is taking hangers. And I love Oscar Allen. When I'm hearing that their entire midfield's fit and Jinby's playing good midfield minutes, it's just yes, please. Jeremy McGovern's in career best fitness, and it's just I'll I'm just, I'll buy in. Sweet. Sometimes you've got to take a swing in these exercises, and I'll Man. do it to the Eagles. Why not? They're not hurting anyone. Uh, I love Oscar Allen. A lot, you know my love for Oscar Allen, Smith. I think their small forwards have got to create a sense of excitement, urgency, and pressure. So, yep, Liam Ryan, awesome. Jack Petrocelli, cool. Jamie Cripps, right? Offensively, they can cause some damage on their day. But, my God, do they need to trap that ball inside their forward 50. They really do. But if I'm going to take a swing, I'll take it on the Eagles. I hope Josh Allen kicks 50 and just... Uh, Oscar Allen. Did I say Josh Allen? Yeah. <laughs> Buffalo Bills quarterback <laughs> coming to play for the Eagles, which I love. I hope Oscar Allen kicks 50 and just takes the piss. So for that reason, I'll take the over. I like the Eagles. Interesting. For Very some interesting. Reason. There we go. All right, the Bulldogs, 12 and a half. Now, Smid, I heard everything you said about your port spiel, and given that logic, you're going the under. Correct. Yeah, um, they were my ladder sliders in your little um, – preseason gauntlet that we did Daz and I couldn't be further off a team if I tried to be honest um I don't know what they're doing I really don't you know they they have massive problems down back and what do they do they go they move earth to get Rory Lobb as their fourth tall forward on the list what what are we doing like you know it, it doesn't make any sense to me they are always going to have the midfield firepower, but where did that get them last year? An elimination final loss that they just scraped in thanks to results. Cool. You know, is that what you're going to aim for? Um, I can't see them making the finals. When going 13 and not or 13 and 10, you know, would probably be good enough to make an elimination final. And um, I just don't see it happening. Yes, they brought in Liam Jones, but being out of the system for 
what is it now, two years, you know, is he just going to come in straight away and be what he was at Carlton? I don't know. Alex Keith is another year older. And has he been that fantastic for the dogs? Um, I don't really think so. Um, have they got a genuine small forward stopper down there? I'd argue no. Like, how, how are they going to stop opposition forward lines kicking big scores? What are they going to do when they come up against Carlton? Who, who's going to play on Harry McKay? Who's going to play on Charlie Kerno? Who's going to stop them scoring? You know, you go to Geelong, Hawkins, Stengel, Cameron, you know, Gary Rowan. Who, who's going to stop them scoring? I, I don't know. You know, you can have the best midfield in the world, but I, I just don't want to buy into them, to be honest. I'm going under. I'm just genuinely surprised Gary Rowan got a run in this episode. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> Shout out to you. Yeah, we're on. Yeah, I'm going the under as well, but I think this is just going to be a genuine 12 and 11 case. It's got that's just what the Bulldogs are. They've got a young spine. So you've got Sam Darcy, Jed Buzzlinger, you got your the younger guys up forward. Where does Josh Bruce fit into this side? I'm not really sure. I don't think losing Lockie Hunter and Josh Dunkley uh, is as big of a deal. Now, they're big losses in terms of quality of player. So don't get this wrong. But Luke Beveridge keeps doing weird things to this midfield mix that really get on my nerves. So considering they've now got a genuine core that didn't really get added to in the draft, which is good. Fine. I'm 100% happy with the way that they've done that because I think they drafted Charlie Clark as well or one of the good small forwards. So that helps, right? So the Bont and McRae are going to be at every center bounce. And then from there, do you rotate your Adam Trelaw, your Riley West, your Libba, these guys that are going to – Roll through as well. That is a more cohesive side that I love, but I think the youth holds them back a touch. 12 and 11, whether that's enough on percentage to get them into the eight, I'd probably say no, but I'm still going to take the under, but maybe with more wins than you're projecting, Smithy. But that's it. One of the longest Daz Talks footy videos, but getting a chance to talk to the great man about footy is absolutely fantastic, Smith. So thanks for jumping on. I think we've got four or five different, so bragging rights up for offer because I absolutely whooped you last year. <laughs> yeah, um, got a few wrong last year, but you know that that doesn't have to be brought up. It's all about 2023, does. We're in a new year, so that those predictions can be left behind. Yeah, new year, new us, mate. But thanks for That's joining it. us, and uh, we'll probably get you on. Well, not probably, we will be getting you on throughout 2023, which I can't wait for. No worries, mate. It's been a pleasure. Always good. And let let me know down in the comments what I got right and wrong. Always happy to uh, have a chat with you guys in the comments. So um, yeah, thanks, mate. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely, mate. So if you enjoyed the video, click that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. We're expanding the Daz Talks footy family, trying to get to a 1,000 before round one. So you've got to jump on, join the clan. It's going to be fantastic. And until next time, from Smithy and I, goodbye.